Hi everyone, and welcome to the second lecture for this week. In this lecture, we'll be looking at different kinds of phonological distribution. So a quick explanation of what this distribution is and how we'll use it in phonological analysis is that the sounds in a language kind of have patterns with how they're distributed. Certain sounds can occur in similar environments certain sounds never occur in the same environment. So we'll be looking at contrastive distribution and complementary distribution primarily. Later on, we may talk a little bit about free variation, but we're mostly interested in these first two. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about contrastive and complementary distribution. Contrastive distribution is when we have a couple of sounds, so two sounds, three sounds, even more sometimes, and these sounds distinguish words with different meanings. So what I mean by that is that, for example, at the bottom of this little page, we have the English words post and toast. So those have the sound p, the voiceless bilabial stop, and the sound t, the voiceless alveolar stop, at the start of the words. So post and toast are different words and they have different sounds at the start of the words, but other than that, they are the, the same sounds. So the p and the t are the only difference between post and toast. However, that one sound difference is enough to change the meaning of the word. Post and toast, uh, in addition to sh showing that p and t are in contrastive distribution, post and toast is a minimal pair. So minimal pairs are two words that have different meanings and they differ only by one sound that occurs in the same environment. So post and toast show that the p and the t are different sounds because they both occur at the start of the word and they give the word different meanings but other than them, the word is the same. So basically we're seeing that the P and the T are contrastive, so they're not the same sound. We also can say that their distribution isn't predictable. So because they occur in the same environment, there's no clue as to whether one of them can occur in a certain situation and the other can't because Basically, we have the same data for both of the sounds. So P and T are what are called different phonemes. Phonemes are basically a term for an underlying sound segment of a language. So basically, a P sound um, is a phoneme of English, and a T sound is another phoneme of English. So basically, all the individual sounds we have in English are a type of phoneme or a type of underlying sound of the language. There can also be minimal triplets or even more. You can have four or five, however many um, examples. Um, for example, there's made, mood, and mode, where we have three different vowel sounds. And these vowel sounds are in between the same consonant sounds. They're in the same position. But the, may, the words made, mood, and mode all have different meanings. So this is another example of contrastive distribution. Uh, there are also near minimal pairs, which strictly speaking aren't contrastive distribution or aren't proof of it anyway. But sometimes minimal pairs for two sounds are hard to find. So if we're trying to prove, for example, that the sound the, so the sound here, the, and the sound here, je, are minimal pairs, or rather that they're um, two different sounds, it's hard to think of words that have those two sounds in the same position, but otherwise are exactly the same. Um, so what we do sometimes in that case is take a near minimal pair, where the immediately adjacent environment of those two sounds is the same, even if the whole word isn't the same. So leather and pleasure Leather has the, pleasure has je. So even though they're not, strictly speaking, a minimal pair, a 
situation like this can sometimes be taken as at least suggesting that the sounds might be in contrastive distribution. So contrastive distribution is when we have two sounds that are different sounds and they occur in the same environment. Complementary distribution is when we have two sounds or two, basically two sounds, and they occur in different environments only rather than the same environment like we saw in contrastive distribution. So in complementary distribution, we have phonemes or kind of the underlying sounds that actually have different phonetic realizations. So what that means is we have the same underlying sound, but we actually say it differently because of the environment it's occurring in. So this is probably the most important um, point of this week that phonemes can be pronounced differently depending on the other sounds around them. So some examples of complementary distribution are the aspirated P in English. So the aspirated P I have alluded to before, but we have this um, P, the first sound in pat, so if you see that little H above the P, uh, that means that the P is aspirated. So that means there's a little puff of air coming right after the P and before the next vowel sound. So if you hold your hand in front of your mouth and say pat, you might feel that puff of air. And then if you do the same thing and say spat, that puff of air won't be there. So we have the P with a puff of air or the aspirated P and we have the P without it, or the unaspirated P. These are two different sounds, and it also just so happens that there aren't any minimal pairs in English where the unaspirated P and the aspirated P signal a difference in meaning for a word. So basically we can say that these two types of P, the aspirated and unaspirated, are in predictable environments. So we have in English this aspirated P, which occurs only at the start of words. So if a P is at the start of a word, then it is aspirated and it has that puff of air. Then we have the unaspirated P. So the unaspirated P only occurs, um, at least in the data we have so far, it only occurs after the letter S or after the S sound. So we have two predictable variants of the underlying sound P, where one of them is aspirated and the other one isn't. The term for this, where we have two types of the same sound, is allophone. So two sounds are allophones of each other if they occur in mutually exclusive environments. So if they only ever occur in different environments, then they are allophones. So one sound occurs in a certain context and the other sound occurs in a different context. Allophones are in what's called complementary distribution and they're predictable forms of the underlying sound or the underlying phoneme. So because the aspirated P only occurs at the start of words, we can make predictions about when a P sound will be aspirated or when it won't be. And there are a lot of different uh, sounds like that in English and other languages where we can predict uh, which type of that sound we will end up hearing. Another way to think about this that uh, kind of takes away the, um, the, ph the phonology part of it to think of what complementary distribution is is to think a little bit about Superman. So Superman and Clark Kent are the same person, right? Um, except Superman, we only ever see in some kind of situation where he's trying to save the world or something like that. Clark Kent, we see in the other situations. So the non-world ending situations, he's just trying to do his job as a reporter. So Superman and Clark Kent are the same person, kind of the same person in an underlying way. So basically we have that underlying phoneme. And then we have the allophones are Superman and Clark Kent, and they only occur in their specific environments. So Superman is only in that 
uh, world saving environment and Clark Kent is in the other environments. So that's a, kind of just a different way to think about what complementary distribution actually is. Um, so like I mentioned, we have the surface allophones. So the sounds that we actually hear, the unaspirated P and the aspirated P. So um, then we have the underlying phoneme. So that's just kind of um, not an actual sound, but um, the underlying concept of the sound. And then the sounds we actually hear are the surface allophones. So that is kind of the basics of complementary distribution. And like I mentioned, there are predictable um, kind of, we can make predictions about where they will occur. So the aspirated P with the puff of air is the specific allophone. So it occurs in a limited environment. So generally at the start of words, or if it is kind of the start of a word, we can still put a prefix on the word and we'll still have the aspirated P. So we have pit, pass, pat, those are all aspirated repeat, so we have peat and then re on the start of it, and then pod, uh, so those are all aspirated. And then the other one, the unaspirated P, occurs in all the other environments. So it occurs uh, after the S in spit, it occurs at the end of tip, it occurs in tipped, erupt, tipper, tip off. So um, basically the Usually when we have allophones, one of them will occur in a specific environment and the other one will occur in everywhere else. So uh, you don't need to worry about this little chart too much. It's just one way that you could represent that we have an underlying sound. So the, alloph the phoneme P or the phoneme T, and then we have the allophones of it. So we have an unaspirated P and aspirated P we have an unaspirated T and an aspirated T. So uh, you might see these charts sometimes. What they're referring to are that um, we have the underlying phoneme and then we have the ways that we actually say the sound underneath it. So complementary and contrastive distribution can vary by the language. So just like we saw that some languages might have a certain natural class that another language might not have, some languages can have contrastive distribution or complementary distribution where the other language might not. So if you have your books, this is on page 57 to 60, kind of discussed there a little bit, but um, in the language called Hoopa, we have the unaspirated T and the aspirated T. So a T without the puff of air and the T with the puff of air. So these are contrastive phonemes. So basically they are different phonemes and they will signal that we are talking about a different sound and a different word. Whereas in English, those two would actually be underlying allophones of the same underlying phoneme. And then we have these vowels, the I vowel and the U vowel. In Hoopa, those are predictable allophones. So those are both allophones of the same phoneme. Whereas in English, they would be two different phonemes because in English for us, those are two different vowels. But in Hoopa, it's basically the same vowel, just said in different ways. So um, kind of based off of that discussion, uh, if you have a little bit of time before we move on to the next lecture, uh, there is a kind of brain teaser question. Um, I don't necessarily have a answer to give out to you, but um, well, I do have an answer to give out to you, but I'm not going to give it out to you in this lecture. Um, basically, I'd like you to think about whether English has um, oral and nasal vowels that occur in different conditions. So basically, um, English has vowels where the air is passing only through the mouth or the air is passing through the nose also. So um, one way you can kind of see if a vowel is nasalized is to hold your finger under your nose and see if there's any air passing through it when you say it. So um, if you try saying the word nasal, you may feel a puff of air out of your nose when you say the first A in nasal. Um, 
you might not feel that same puff of air when you say the word oral. Um, so basically there are some conditions where vowels will be nasal or not. Uh, so if you think about that a little bit, um, try to come up with um, when we might have a nasal vowel and when we might have an oral vowel. Um, basically, uh, there is going to be a pattern and doing this exercise will help you, I think, with the get started on the homework problems that I will post later this week. So that's all I have for this little bit of the lecture. In the next lecture, we'll be discussing more phonological topics. Um, so if you're feeling still confused, uh, go ahead and review or go ahead and ask questions. And um, hopefully you're not having too much trouble, but if you are, I'll do my best to help you through it.